Hi y'all, good morning. Welcome to my ITA takeover. My name is Charlotte Johnston. I'm from the US, the Carolinas specifically. I'm 28 years old, about to turn 29. And I teach and live in Changyang, South Korea. It's about 8.10 here in Korea. I need to hop in my car. Yeah, I have a car, so you can ask me about it. At about, what, 8.25 to get to my job at 8.35. So usually in the morning before that, I just get my steps in and walk around a little reservoir area, as you can see, beautiful mountain town, um, and get my steps in before work. So that's what I'm gonna do, and I'll see you in a bit. So I've lived in Korea for four years. I did a one year stint from 2017, 2018 in Gochang, and I've been living like one month shy of three years now in Changyang. And I work for the GOE, which is the Gyeongtang Namdo Office of Education. That's what I did the first year. That's what I've been doing uh, here in Changyang. And it's public school and it's basically like Epic, except you're specifically placed in the Gyeongtang Namdo province. Like all the perks are pretty much the same. You just know exactly what province you will be placed in when you apply, which is pretty cool if you ask me. And I've loved my time with the GOE. Like I highly recommend it. So if you have any questions about the GOE, let me know. I'm driving to my school right now. I work at two schools. My main school is about a 10 minute drive from my home and my travel school is about a 20 minute drive from my home. If you apply uh, to public schools via the GOE, you could have up to three schools. Um, I had that my first year when I lived in Gachang and I honestly didn't like it just because if you teach at three schools, you don't really have the opportunity to make relationships with your students and your teachers. You, like you don't really have much rapport because you're not seeing them that often. Uh, this time in Changyang, I have my main school and just one travel school, so that's fine to me. It's not that bad. I work at my main school three days a week and my travel school two days a week. And if you work at a travel school, you get paid extra money, which is always amazing. Changyang is famous for onions. Like we literally just passed an onion research center, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Uh, the McDonald's here had like a specialty burger and nobody really knows about Changyang. So when it was like, oh, it features Changyang onions, it was pretty, like it was pretty funny. And people were like, what's, what's Changyang? Uh, yeah. But um, like I said, Changyang is really small. A lot of Koreans don't really know about it, um, especially if you're not in the Gyeongsang Namdo province. But we are famous for a big mountain, which I hike once a week. It's called Hwawangtan. And this town also has Korea's largest wetland conservatory. Uh, it's called Upo Nup Nup, which is, uh, Upo is like the name and Nup is like marsh, swamp. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Interesting fa fun facts about Changyong. Gotta represent. Okay, I'm pulling into my school. My school is, an, I teach at two elementary schools. <laughs> and um, my class sizes at my travel school, it's like ranges from two to six. And at my main school, which is still a pretty small school, the biggest class size is um, 13. So I actually really like my small school size. It uh, makes life pretty easy. So this is my school. I have my first class in about 10 minutes. I have five classes today, three before lunch and two after lunch. And I'm not really allowed to film my students or my classes, but when I have time, I'll show you where my desk is and some of the facilities. And yeah, so stay tuned. So I have a 20 minute break before my next class. I have already taught two classes I have one more before lunch, and then I have two after lunch. Uh, so I figured we could talk about why I chose to teach abroad, why Korea, and uh, how the whole process went for me. So the biggest reason I wanted to move abroad and start teaching English is that when I was in college, I changed my major way too many times, and I didn't have enough time to study abroad. And 
uh, moving abroad, teaching English seemed like the easiest, quickest way for me to go abroad and travel a lot um, while I'm young. And so after I graduated with my bachelor's in journal journalism and mass communication, I like immediately signed up for ITA's 120 hour uh, TIFL course. And I was certified really quickly. Like I just like, you know, booked through it because I really wanted this. So I took the course, I, I did the hours, I got my certification, and then I immediately started looking for jobs in Japan. And because I um, don't speak Japanese and I didn't have any experience teaching, I applied to JET and I did not get even like the first interview the, through the first stage. And so I reevaluated and I decided on Korea. And so I applied to like basically the equivalent of JET, which would be EPIC, but I didn't apply to EPIC. I applied to the GOE. So like I said earlier, like specifically to the Gyeongsangnam-do province. Um, and like, in my opinion, it was really easy. I used a recruiter, um, Korean Horizons. It's one guy, his name is Alistair Weary, but I think he let somebody take over his company. So. I'm not quite sure what he's doing, but he was super helpful, always there to answer questions. And like, it, I don't know, to me it was really easy. People say it's hard, but I thought the application process was easy. Okay, so first question, is the GOE as competitive as EPIC? I, I'm gonna say no, just because if you apply to EPIC, people who do that are trying to be placed maybe in the bigger cities like Seoul, Busan, or Daegu, or even like Gwangju or Daejeon. And we don't, like those aren't in this province. Um, none, no city that big is in this province. So there aren't as many people applying, I guess, for the small town rural jobs because maybe it's not as attractive to them. So it's slightly less competitive, I would definitely say. Um, but in terms of the hiring process and the seasons, it's exactly the same as well as perks and the benefits because it's all public school through the Korean government. Like you're working a public school government job. So everything's the same except how you like who you apply to. But adding on to that, because the GOE only hires for Gyeongsangnam-do, there's going to be less jobs because the jobs are only for this one province, not the entire country. So if you apply to Epic, yeah, there's a lot more jobs, but I also think there's more people applying for the jobs. If you apply to GOE, it's just one province, so there are less jobs available, but I think there's less people applying for those jobs. Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk about why I chose Japan at first and ultimately Korea. I had a lot of student loans when I graduated college, like most of us do. And I didn't want to get like a regular nine to five job in the States. I knew I wanted to move abroad and teach English. So I looked at where I could make the most money. That's, that's pretty much it. And Japan, it was like, you know, everybody knew about Japan. It was way more popular than Korea. Recently, Korea is like all over the world taking over. Um, but Japan at the time was like, oh, you know, everybody knows about Japanese food, Mount Fuji. Um, so I, did that, but when I didn't get in, I quickly was like, oh, South Korea, no brainer. That's the next place I would wanna teach. And Korea is where you can actually save the most money. So it really worked out because I paid off my student loans in the first year I taught here. Okay, so lesson planning with the GOE. I can't speak for middle schools and high schools because I only teach at elementary schools, but I do know their lesson planning is a lot harder just because uh, you know, the students know a lot more, so the lessons are harder and more in depth and there's more English to teach. Elementary school, you just teach the basics over and over and over again. And if you work at a bigger school, you're going to have multiple classes of the same grade level. So you could be teaching the same exact lesson like four times a day. So in that regard, it's easy because there's less work. I don't teach at big schools, so every day I teach uh, five to six different lessons but I've been teaching for so long that I have all my lessons down. And all I have to do is come in and assess like, you know, who might need extra help? How could I change the lesson to meet the class? And like, I don't know, it takes like 10 minutes to, to edit a lesson. Like it's not, I'm, I have my, my USB full of all my lesson plans. 
So your schools will provide you with a textbook. If you work at multiple schools like I do, you might be in a situation where you have two different textbooks, which I do. And that's fine because the lessons are pretty similar. Um, maybe a few different vocab terms, slightly different variations on the dialogue, but they're pretty, they're pretty similar. Okay, and you'll have uh, your intro followed by listening, speaking, reading, writing, okay? And so you have like one day per each of those things and you can teach straight from the book, but it's really boring and a class is 40 minutes and it won't take 40 minutes to finish the book activities. Like you could finish it in like 20 minutes. You could even finish in 10 minutes if your kids are really high level. And so it's gonna be boring. So you need to add in your own games and activities and ways of teaching. And once you've been doing teaching for a while, you just get used to it and you know your style and you know what you're good at. There are online resources full of lesson plans. Like I use waygook.org. You make an account and then people upload all their lesson plans and you can download them and adjust them to what you need. And then once you do that, you have a USB full of lessons that you can use like for, for years. Obviously you should adjust them like before you teach each class because you know, it's not gonna be the same for every class and you'll students, your students will have different needs or maybe it's too easy for them or too advanced for them. So you need to change the lesson, but it's an online resource, like work smarter, not harder. I know people who make lessons from scratch, like make all their PPTs and that's awesome. Like that's cool, but who has time to do all of that? when you could download things offline and adjust them and make them awesome to fit your needs and your students' needs. So basically, like when you first start, it could take like, I don't know, an hour to make a lesson just because you're not used to it and you don't know how. But once you get it down and once you are using other resources and you have your own resources that you know how to change and edit to fit your students' needs, you can you can make a lesson in like 10 minutes because you already have the lesson. You just need to adjust it for the day. So lesson planning can be hard at first. It gets super easy. So don't stress too much about it, but make sure you're changing it and not doing the same games every time because kids will get really bored and school should be really fun, especially teaching English should be fun. So the kids want to use it and remember it. So. I think that's enough on lesson planning, but if you have any other questions, just DM me. I'll put my uh, personal thing on here and you can send me a message. Thanks. Okay, so it's about to be lunchtime. Today's meal is amazing and I'm not lying when I say Korean school lunch is the best part about my job. Sure, I get 26 vacation days. I have 11 sick days. I make a good salary. I have a lot of bonuses. I don't pay rent. I have a free apartment. My bills are cheap. No, it's the school lunch for me. Let me show you why. Look at that beauty. We got some kimchi bokkeumbap, kimchi fried rice. Hon chija alun gui. Kiwi juice. Yorinji kang. Kimchi. So I just ate lunch. It was decadent. It was beautiful. It was amazing. I'm so full and I have a bit of time before my next class at 1.30. So usually after I eat lunch, I walk around my school grounds, get more steps in. So I'll answer this question. So after I graduated, I worked for a little bit, but then I pretty much just moved to Korea. So I haven't had the opportunity to start a 401k or an IRA. And I'm a little stressed about that, to be honest. Maybe I shouldn't be, or maybe I should be but I am. And so that's one of the reasons I'm moving home in about a month. Um, I've lived in Korea for four years and I'm going home now so I can maybe save for retirement. That way I save about a thousand a month, a thousand USD a month, and I'll get into that later. Um, so I have savings. I just don't have like a 401k or an IRA, which I would like to have. So I'm going home. Visas. So I'm on an E2 visa 
and that's what you would have if you come to Korea to teach English at a public school or a hagwon. Um, but let's talk the GOE because that's what I know. It's easy. You do nothing. Your school will do all the paperwork and your co-teacher will escort you to the immigration office in your city and you just go with them and sign. You do have to pay a little bit of money. It's like maybe 50 USD, but you get a signing bonus. So it, it's fine. It covers it. Easy. Um, and then you'll get your ARC card, alien registration card, which is essentially your visa. And it's good for 13 months. So if you do one year and you're leaving, you have a month leeway to exit the country. And then if you renew, you just go back and you do the same process. It's super simple. You don't have to do any country hops like in other countries. Easy. I need to get gas, so I figured I'd show you that it's super easy and you shouldn't be hesitant. So you just press Shijak, which is start. Do you then enter the um, credit card? It says English right there. Do you 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 uh, the yellow one is just regular. Uh, so boom. Do you I'm gonna put thirty thousand won. Some one one. This is if you have like a loyalty card and I don't, so opsum. So I've left school and I'm driving home, I'm almost home. And I'll show you my apartment. And then if you can see that mountain in the distance, I think I'm gonna go climb it for you. So I can give you the view of Changyong from above. <laughs> So stay tuned for that, especially if you like hiking, I'll talk more about the mountains in the country. And if you know anything about Korea, Korea is 80% mountains, so there's quite a few. Okay, so now I'm going to do the apartment tour. You walk in, you should take your shoes off, I just stepped out with my slippies on, so I'm not gonna. But I have a ton of storage. I have huge closets um, as soon as you walk in for all my stuff. Shoes, toiletries, toilet paper, towels. Okay, and then this is my kitchen. You walk into the kitchen. I have a pretty big space. I have a really big fridge. Um, bought this table so I'd actually have counter space. But yeah, my kitchen is pretty big. And if you turn around, this room is also my exercise room my office and my camping storage area. Very, very nice space with the little bathroom right there. That's all I'm gonna show you. And then we can go into my bedroom. This is my bedroom. I got really lucky and I have two whole rooms. The kitchen itself is one room and then I have a whole big bedroom. I will say it looked a lot different, a lot better, a lot more homey and put together than it does now. I'm moving in a month, so I've already sold a lot of my stuff and it just looks different now. I took all my like picture pictures down, all my Polaroids and stuff, and I sold my closet space. Um, so I just, this is actually where I normally put my laundry, but no. Um, but yeah, it's super homey. It definitely used to be, maybe not now, um, but it's a nice big space. And I also have my washing machine, huge, huge uh, closet space. And then the view. So that was my apartment. I didn't choose it. My school chose it for me and they pay for it. Um, I, no money crosses my hands. I don't do anything with the landlord. The school handles all of that, which is like a running theme. The school does everything for you. So your life is pretty easy. No stress, really. And if you choose in your contract, you can take a 400,000 won housing allowance, which currently is like exactly 300 USD. And if you live in a small town, it totally covers like anything you're looking for. Like my apartment is nice and it's big and it's definitely not 400,000 won. It's probably 350,000 won. So if you like want to find something that exactly is what you want, go ahead, take the housing allowance, but it's gonna be a lot more work. You're gonna have to probably know Korean when you start out and deal with 
landlords and Korean internet searches. And it's just, um, I like my apartment. It's easy. In your GOE contract, it specifies your apartment should be furnished with a bed, a fridge, a table and chair, and a washing machine, and that's it. And so the rest is up to you. The school does, it's not in the contract, however, the school does have money for you, um, like a settlement allowance. Like in your contract, you get a settlement allowance, I think of 300,000 won. But the school also has money set aside for you. Now, I didn't get it, I didn't know about it, but it is a thing, so when you move here, and if you're with a GOE, you should be like, hey, I uh, I heard there might be a settlement allowance for me, you know, you know, because people buy like air fryers and like ovens with that money. So, you know, you do you, try to get your money, okay? Another thing is that with your apartment, uh, you have a high probability of just, you are the replacement, so you're taking the previous teacher's apartment and they might have been really kind and left you a lot of their stuff. And so you already might have uh, plates and cutlery and maybe chairs and things that you need right off the back, like iron vacuum and stuff. So you could save a lot of money that way. I actually did. Nobody's taking over my contract. So I have to get rid of all my stuff, which is why my apartment looks different because I was gonna keep it for people. Um, but now I'm just making money, selling stuff and figuring out what to do with all the things that nobody would want. But you might get really lucky and have a really nice furnished apartment. And if you're not as lucky, you'll have the basics and then you'll get your paycheck and you can buy stuff that you need and make your apartment homey along the way because it's really important to make your apartment homey so that you feel happy in the foreign country. I'm about to hike the mountain in my town, Hwawangsan. So now's a good time to answer a question like this. There are 22 Korean national parks. Um, one is historical, Gyeongju. There's still a lot of hiking, but there's a lot of cool uh, ancient structures to check out. Um, there's three marine national parks, so you can do hikes, you can do coastal walks, you can just check out the marine life. And then the rest are mountainous national parks, and I've hiked all of them. And I have favorites, but it kind of depends on the season and the time and the weather and like, you know, what you ate at the top because mountain food is the best food. Um, but yeah, there's so many hikes in Korea. When a country is 80% mountains, like it's the main pastime and luckily I love hiking. So it worked out. Yeah, there is a huge hiking and camping culture in this country. Like I said, it's 80% mountains. There's 22 national parks. There's dozens of provincial parks and a bunch of other awesome hikes that aren't designated like the one I'm about to do or I'm doing. Um, during COVID, when the safe things were to do outside, camping and hiking like exploded and trails and camping spots became really crowded and popular and busy. So yeah, if it wasn't a big culture before, which it was, um, it's huge and it's here to stay. Um, to me, it's like one of the best things to do in this country. Like, eat Korean food and hike. And you can do, you can go for a hike, finish it, and then eat mountain food. Like, uh, pajan, sujebi, dotorimuk. <sighs> Hiking food is like the best food, so it's a good pastime to have if you're into it. If you're not into it, get into it. It's available. Hiking is pretty easy to do via public transport. You might have to make like a one day trip that could be possible with a car into a two or maybe a long weekend, three day weekend trip. So I definitely, like I've had a lot more chances to go hiking because I have a car. It's way easier for me to do. But if you don't have a car or if you don't have a friend who has a car, don't worry, like you can go hiking. I have a friend who lives in Seoul and they take a KTX and make a whole weekend out of it, go to do a national park and then go to a city and eat a lot of food. So it's possible. Camping, nah, I think it's way too hard if you don't have a car or a friend who has a car. It's just you have to carry all of your stuff. Um, again, it's possible. You just have to really want to do it. In the four years I've lived here, I've seen pretty much all of Korea, honestly. I've seen more of Korea than most of my Korean friends. And, you know, been to Jeju like three times. Obviously, Seoul, Busan, Daegu, Gwangju, Daejeon, and all the towns that the national parks are in. 
Um, I've done East Coast road trips, West Coast road trips, South Coast road trips. I've done a bunch of island hopping. I think I've seen all of Korea except for Suwon, Sejong, and Paju. And countries I've been to since I've been here are Japan, Thailand, Taiwan, Iceland for a nice three-week trip, and Vietnam. And my contract's about to end, and I'm going to Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Malaysia. So, yeah, I've been able to travel a lot, and I'm super happy, super privileged, and I honestly just can't wait to keep living a lifestyle like this that teaching English abroad provides you. It's a great gig, great life. And that is Chung Young. The view is not that great right now, but there she is in all her glory. And here's the view at the top of Huawangsan. Good, good, good stuff. Uh, Chang Young is like 70,000 people, um, mostly old people and students, not a lot of people in the middle. Uh, not much to do in a small town like this. I'm not complaining, just putting it out there. If you apply to the GOE, there's a big chance you might get placed in a small town. And if you know you're not about that life, if you know you need constant activities and uh, you know, bustling social life and, you know, going out to big restaurants and cafes and going out all the time. It might not be your scene. It's definitely my scene. It's quiet. Um, I have friends. I, there's great, great Korean food. Um, I can go hiking and I can access cities on the weekends. This is a great question because I think Changyang is perfectly located for in terms of driving, it takes me about an hour to get to downtown Daegu. If I took a bus to Busan, it'd be an hour and 15 minutes to Sasang Station, plus a 15-minute subway ride to Seomyeon, like downtown area, and then a 30-minute subway ride to the beach. Seoul is a four-hour bus ride, and that's the only way to get there. Um, I could go to Daegu and take a KTX, but that's like just adding transportation, and I'd rather take the bus. But... Daegu's easy day trip, Busan easy weekend trip, Seoul easy weekend trip or bigger vacation, um, but everything is super manageable to travel. I'm sorry it's so dark. <laughs> Finally getting around to the car question. So I've had my car for a little over two years. I bought it for 1.9 million won, which is about 1400 USD. I just asked my Korean friend, hey, can you help me? And he showed me a used car website and that just, I found some options in my area. And he sold me on a Kia Morning just because he explained that it's, they're cheaper to fix. There were cheaper options, like a Matisse or a Daewoo, but they're a lot more expensive to fix, so it just made more sense to buy a key morning in case I had a problem. Take it to the shop, it'd be cheaper than a Matisse or a Daewoo. So I picked that. I found one that I liked, and then I took uh, a foreign friend with me who was fluent in Korean, and he helped me not really negotiate because I bought it for what it was worth, but he just helped me he translated for me and helped me sign the paperwork. <laughs> for me, it was really easy um, because I've had help the whole way. So the process of getting a car wasn't that hard. Uh, I just scrolled online on a used car website till I found what I wanted and then uh, messaged the person. I used like just Papago to translate messages back and forth and said, set up a meeting. And then I went with another friend who wasn't Korean, but is fluent in Korean. And they helped me with the paperwork. And I, you know, I bought the car, I got the insurance through uh, Insure Korea. And I can, I'm going to put that in a slide. Um, and he deals with foreign clients. So it's all in English there. So it's really easy. And, you know, you just get your information in the mail. They mail it to you. Uh, it's an easy process. Um, it's easy to go get your oil changed. You just find somewhere in town and say, uh, engine oil. <laughs> it's just easy. Um, it's good. For me, the hardest part is going to be selling the car. So if you're in the market for a car, hit me up, DM me. But because uh, no Korean is going to want to buy my piece of junk car. I love her, but she's not that great. Um because a Korean, you know, why invest, like, invest in something nice? So usually it's just like military people or foreigners who want to buy your car. 
but then it's like oh, I don't I'm not fluent in Korean so transferring the title is difficult um, luckily you know I don't ask my co-teacher for that much help but he like straight up offered to help me try to sell it so I'm gonna do that and if I can't if like he like, if I can't find a buyer with his help then I'm just gonna put it basically on an online auction with somebody who's gonna scrap it for parts and get like a third of my money hopefully um yeah but if you want a car hit me up i'll sell it to you cheap i also got my korean license i'm from the u.s and some states have like agreements where you can just swap your u.s license in and get a korean license and you don't have to take a test but my U.S. license is North Carolina, and they don't have that. So I had to get my Korean driver's license, and it took me two tries, but I passed. Um, the toughest part is, you, like, you have the, the online computer test, which is not bad, just study. And then the middle part is the toughest part, which is the driving course. And you have so many points that you have to have, and everything you do wrong is minus points. So you have to have, I think, uh, uh, 80 points, and things are like minus three, minus five points. So if you mess up maybe four times, it's done, and you have to retake it. The third section is the actual driving on the road, and it's really easy. So for me, it cost about 100 USD to get my license because you pay, and then whatever you fail and have to retake, you pay again. So about 100 USD, we'll say, and totally worth it okay i did also have to take the day off work because you have to go when the driving center is open my clo closest driving center was in daegu so you know i i had to go take a day off work and then go do that go to daegu but i went to daegu so then i treated myself to some nice food and some nice coffee and celebrated the second time when i actually got my license and then i got my car like like a week or two weeks later it was really quick and no regrets amazing you have to also do like a every two years get your car inspected and that cost ooh, like 70,000 won and there should be some place in your town and you get something in the mail and it tells you exactly where to go so it's easy I think I'm done. It's been a long day. We've talked about a lot of things. We talked about the GOE, public school, my school lunch, um, why I chose Korea. Um, I showed you my apartment. I showed you town. We hiked the mountain together. Uh, I talked a little bit about my car, showed you the finance breakdown and how much I save. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Hopefully I got to some of your questions. I know you might have more. Please feel free to go to my personal profile and uh, DM me, ask me questions. I'm gonna do a lot of traveling, so if you're into that, you can uh, follow me and see what I'm doing. Uh, I have a lot of Korea stuff, so if you're just looking for ideas of mountains to hike or like what to do on the weekend, you could check out some of my road trip posts. And yeah, it's been a it's been a good day. I hope that you stay tuned and you enjoyed it and you learned something. But thanks for watching my ITA takeover. Bye.